So it's a great pleasure to have Alan here. Thank you. Alan. Thank you very much, uh, Ron. So it's a great pleasure to be here, and I, I would like to thank Ron, his team, uh, and, and Linda and the Open Medicine Foundation for the opportunity to share with you uh, new results about the role of uh, microRNA in the pathogenesis of MECFS. So here are my disclosure. So I would like to present you today uh, and whoops, do some, some uh, review of the current challenges that we are facing, not only as a researcher, but of course the patients and the clinicians. A brief description of the Quebec court, which is, I start from scratch, so as today is probably one of the largest cohort of MECFS in Canada and sharing with you some, uh, uh, some of our results and what we are doing with those results. Why developing some interest about the role of circulating microRNA? What, what, what can we do with that? So we give you some, some example of uh, the potential clinical utility uh, of using uh, these uh, small uh, non-coding RNA as biomarker and potentially as a potential ter therapeutic target and where are the next steps. So as you may know, and this is a graph that probably summarizes quite well what is happening in the MECFS or also in maybe other severe chronic diseases. So the patient has a healthy phase in his life or her life, and there are some initial triggers that often involve virus infections, could be also bacterial infections, so this is the little box on the top corner. And those environment factors have a huge impact, and we suspect that there are some predisposition factors that will further uh, react to uh, these uh, primary infections somehow. Why you, are, you have an infection, and this, this infection is often prolonged, and beyond the infection, you have also some other factors, chemicals, uh, different other factors, uh, heavy metals get, can, be, can act as, as a triggers. So that brings you to the disease onset. Few of the patients can have a full remission, but others will may continue to progress, either because they are continuously exposed to some uh, environmental factors, but they might also, also in presence of disease modifier that will further induce a progression of the disease in the chronicity. So we don't know much about that, but we need to understand that. So the relationship between environment factors and the genes that may predispose to have this type of response. So I think this is something very important. So last year I show you different type of elephants. So now I switch for apples. So how can we separate you? So uh, you want talk about food. So I'm, uh, I, we ne never communicate, but we, we stay in the, the field of food. So how can we phase or address the clinical heterogeneity of MECFS how to select and compare. It's clear that we are facing a spectrum as part of the disease, so there is not a single entity. And that starts with some difficulties in the clinical definition, definition issues of MECFS, how we select patients in the past, as we select patients today, and maybe how we will select patients in the future using novel tools. We are working often on small cohort for different reasons, often due to a lack of uh, significant funding. They have some maybe issue about different ethnic background and also the toys as a researcher we are using. So the multiplicity of omics methods, which are very expensive and sophisticated methods. But again, there's not a single lab in the world that can allow to use all the omics in the same labs. So that's why it's very important that we can collaborate. To add to further to the difficulty to further define a patient, patients come to us at different disease stages. They use different drugs, different supplements, so it's, it's very hard, even with very sophisticated tools, to further understand that. But this is part of the reality of the patient. We have to understand that. And plus, MECFS occurring in aging populations bring you to also additional challenge of comorbidities because there is no such a thing as a pure MECFS. You have MECFS and maybe osteoarthritis, MECFS with some form of cancers, MECFS with rheumatoid arthritis or autoimmune disorder. So we need to introduce and understand that. 
plus in the past, whatever was your disease triggers, so we need to understand that, but we, ca we can hardly de de follow the source of those triggers in, in your past. We can have a reflection about what is happening by, do by looking at different factors. So our hypothesis is MECFS is caused by a disturbance in the expression of small non-coding uh, RNA called microRNA, which modulate immune function, energy metabolism, and physiological stress response. And indeed, we believe that microRNA could be the link between environmental factor, genetic predisposition, and phenotypic difference. Why some patients have those symptoms and others have different symptoms? So you are not like the same, so you are different type of apples. Some of you are even disguise yourself as hypos slash some oranges. So we need to understand that. Why it's so important is because if we have a good understanding, maybe using microRNA could be a good link to establish the link between these stages, the disability across cohorts, and eventually help us to have a better understanding of the etiology and to determine not only the molecular, epigenetic, and genetic mechanism, but eventually follow and identify for the first time therapeutic targets. So this is a brief, 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 brief description about why microRNA are very important. So microRNA are part of your genomes. They are expressed, and they have different molecules, different stressors. Only stress by itself can trigger or downregulate microRNA. So microRNA will attach to the messenger RNA and will do two things. First thing, we'll introduce a decay, so the, me the messenger RNA will disappear, which means that it won't be translated in protein, so you will have less of the protein, or can also block the translation with the ribosomal machinery, and you won't have any protein anymore. Why this is very important? Because one single microRNA can target up to 200 different genes. And many genes can be targeted by different microRNA. So very small molecule, but very, very powerful, and can harm you uh, by many ways. Here is a, a demographic and clinical data of our cohort. So as of today, we are around more 200 patients. 85% of them are homebound. So we have to send clinical nurses to test them. And of course, we need to establish some reference value, so we need to have LT volunteers that are willing to participate in the test. Because the patients are so different, we need to try a way to regulate such a difference. So we develop what we call a stress test, and thanks to the work of uh, one of the uh, patients, that I know is watching today. Uh, this patient, I would just call him Christian. So Christian stressed me a lot about if you have to develop a test, you should develop a test that can mimic the post-suggestional malaise. And this is what we have done with the help of Christian. And we apply a cough, inflated cough, from a massage machine. So this machine technique is offering a therapeutic massage. Very gentle massage, but this gentle massage, after 90 minutes, creates a stress that mimics the symptom of post-exertional malaise. Trust me. Okay, sounds a bit weird. <laughs> we never push anyone to uh, the emergency room, thanks God, but it's, it's really working. So we have a value at baseline, and every 30 minutes, up to 90 minutes. So each patient becomes its own control, which is the beauty of this test. So whatever you are taking medication, whatever you are suffering a disease from three years or 20 years, you become your own control, and we are doing the same with healthy controls. So this is the workflow of the analysis. So we prepare the plasma of the patient, we extract the microRNA, we establish a profile, and from a potential soup of 2,500 microRNA, we end up with 32 microRNA that seems to be highly associated with MECFS. So this is a big reduction. I'm not saying that we capture all of them, because you can use different kit and technology, but from 2,500 end up with 32 that we started to validate. So what do we learn so far? So you have different 
code of colors that show you the difference between the stimulation or at baseline. So MECFS patients exhibit a distinct molecular footprint at baseline and also at stimulation. And what we saw so far, we have more information after the stimulation uh, of the microRNA that seems to be more informative about MECFS disease. So, and we are doing the, the, uh, the relative value after simulation and at baseline for each participant. I will give you a few examples of what we have found so far. So we find a microRNA and they have a weird name, so it always started with MIR, but you have some number, 127.3p. This MIR has been previously discovered in an Australian cohort of MECFS patient. So for us, that was very encouraging that Canadian and Australian looks alike, <laughs> even though that we are very far apart. <laughs> What is very interesting in terms of pathways is this mirror, and, and, and you see the, the, the value at baseline is elevated versus the control, and the same after sim stimulation. But what is very important, we, we have access to a software called EPA that allowed us to predict or uh, link the microRNA to validate the target. In that case, this mirror is targeting BCL6, which is a negative regulator of interleukin 10, which is highly important in the regulation of different functions involving lymphocyte T, for instance. And the elevation of interleukin 10 has been previously reported in cerebrospinal fluid of MECFS. So again, we replicate results from others for the very first time, good news. So which means that this may seem really associated with MECFS, and we can give to this may a role, a significance in, in the metabolism so that could impact lymphocyte development or function. Another mirror is the mirror 145P. So this mirror is elevated at baseline in many patients, not all of them, and after stimulation, but this mirror is targeting a membranous receptor called CT, CD20, which is the receptor targeted by rituximab. So when I saw that result, I, I thought that probably Dr. Fluid would be interested that we need to talk, and this week we agreed that it would be worth to assess um, his patients in the clinical trial to see which patient have a low level of this meal that could be good candidate versus the one that have high level of this meal that could not be a good candidate for rituximab. If you remember the presentation of Dr. Flugit, one third of patients are non-responder. I don't know, I don't know his patient, but this is part of this meeting. We are engaged now in a possible collaboration to further examine his patient to, under, to understand why the non-responder are co possibly are the one that produce that. So just to show you the link, this is the value of individual patients. So you have in blue at baseline and in purple at first stimulation. You can see that, not easily, but if you count them, 27% at baseline show at least a twofold overexpression of this microRNA. So I don't know yet if twofold is enough to disqualify the patient, but that with a group of patients that I wouldn't consider for rituximab. But the other one, you have seen the patient with very low level that could be potentially someone that could respond better to rituximab treatment. So this is something that we need to explore, and through collaboration, it's the only way to assess that. Another MIR, MIR, MIR 155P, again, we saw a very, very strong overexpression only after simulation, and we tried to assess or qualify the patient, what is special to the patient having this high level? And we saw that patient having very high level of this microRNA are the ones that have a better mental fatigue score. So it's going against the concept of stressing the patient. Those stressed by the stimulation, at least for this microRNA, seems to have a better improvement of their mental fatigue. Very interesting. It becomes even more interesting because this mirror is targeting a gene called SLCSA2, 
which encode a multi-pass membrane protein that is involved in the reuptake of norepinephrine. The EPA pathway automatically gave us also other molecules that then do the, the same thing. And du duloxetin was a drug that's been tested in MECFS patient before I, I, I knew what, what is happening. And they end up with the same conclusion. The duloxetin is not improving fatigue, but is improving mental fatigue as well. Different cohort, different strategy, same conclusion. So again, that further strengthened the value of what we are doing. Another meal that is, this one is interesting because this microRNA, the 374B, is very low in fibromyalgia patient and is going in the opposite direction in MECFS patient. So possibly this is a way to clearly dis make a difference at the molecular level between MECFS and fibromyalgia. So very interesting uh, molecules. Now, this is where it's, the, the fun things happen. Each line here, so you have seven microRNA that we are considering. Each line represents a patient. Forget about the number. The number is not really important, but the yellow is a diminution when it's stimulated, and the blue, it's, it's a positive effect, so the stimulation increases this microRNA. You can see very specific patterns that allowed us to class classify a patient in four specific subtypes. I'm not telling you that this is the final version of the whole thing, but this is the beginning of something. Now, why doing this molecular certification? That's the key question. Why? Because the subgroup one, when we ask the patient following the test whether the symptom of post-exertional malaise, that's the one that so reports the worst symptom at the level of post-exertional malaise, as opposed to the subtype, subtype number four, which show almost half of them no symptom at all. If we ask for other symptom, the group one show, the only one show mental fogginess and vertigo dizziness. Very interesting as opposed to, again, the number four, which seems to have less symptom or no symptom at all. Very interesting. So doing that, we look about to revisit other biochemical factors that we have identified in the past and I put up the, up the first pie is the group one, the last one is group four, and you see looking about a, a factor called thrombospondin one, which is an anti-angiogenic factor. So TSP1 is more elevated after the stimulation in the group one and could contribute to a kind of vasoconstriction in those patients, which explain why they feel a mental fogginess because you have some effect on the brain blood flow as opposed to the group four, which have less symptom, is going in the opposite direction. What is very interesting is thrombospondin is known to act through two receptors. Now we could eventually start to in vitro experiments to validate if I block one receptor or the other one with agonist or antagonist, I can either mimic or prevent these effects. Don't start to look at the literature and try to have those drugs and experiment on yourself. We don't know yet to what extent, but this is the beginning of something. That's why I put a warning site on my slide. So where we are going, we need to further validate the remaining uh, microRNA in a large, larger MECFS cohort because right now we can split them in four subtypes. We need also to validate in other cohorts, and the key word here is replicate, replicate, and replicate. So, but I think we are on something, and the only one that we can bring a clinical value of what we're doing is through collaboration. We need to work, and this week was an incredible week, because now we established some collaboration, and we can start to assess the validity and utility of, of, uh, of this new molecular certification. Finally, I would like to acknowledge special thanks to all the patient, participant, healthy volunteers that also are participating to our test because the test is a bit demanding. It's at least two hours. And also thanks to the support to uh, many advocacy groups that support our work, CBLAC Foundation for their uh, incredible funding, and a, a big thanks to my staff and graduate student and collaborator that without them, we were, I, I, will, I will be here today. So many thanks for your support.
Thank you. Thank you very much, Alain. Um, I know it's hard to break the clapping habit. Uh, right immediately after uh, asking everybody not to do that, I did it. So I apologize for that. <laughs> So it's, uh, it's pretty wired in. Um, okay, so uh, our next speaker is going to be Maureen Hansen of Cornell University, who's going to continue the discussions of metabolism in uh, MECFS. Well, I, uh, I think I first met Maureen at one of the MECFS meetings. It might have been the one in London. Uh, and then I saw her get up and tell the researchers what they were doing wrong. And I said, wow, this is, this is, this is a wonderful researcher, because she was absolutely right. <laughs> and uh, so uh, she's totally dedicated to figuring this out. And uh, she's a plant biologist. But she knows a lot about mitochondria, because plants have mitochondria. Um, and so she's another one that uh, I have felt when Maureen says, I'm going to be doing this, and I say, fantastic. Uh, I don't have to do that. Uh, that's another one of those things that uh, she can figure it out. 